That's correct. All right. So here uh, we're talking about the role of the Holy Spirit. We, we started talking about this uh, last week. We're going to talk about it again this week. And we want to ask the question, does the Spirit indwell the Christian? Let me just throw that out there. Does the Spirit indwell the Christian? What do you think? I'm not asking how or anything like that. I'm, I'm simply asking, do you believe, do you think that the Spirit indwells the Christian? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Does anybody disagree with that? Does anybody think, no, the Spirit does not indwell? So, um, if we look at Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 through 39, it's a very um, familiar passage for us, especially within... Uh, within our tradition, because uh, this is the passage we go to to talk about, a lot of times, to talk about what a person must do in order to be safe. Um, and so in Acts chapter 2, 38 through 39, it says, And Peter said to them, this is after he was preaching Jesus, um, Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. So let me ask you a question. Um, the, the, the promise here, is this limited to a certain group of people only? Is this, is this a limited promise or is this more of a general promise for all people at all times? A general all people at all times. All right. The lanes jumped in there. All people, all times. Anybody else? What do you think? What makes you think, Elaine, what, what, what indicates to you that this is a promise for all people at all times? The forgiveness of, holy, of your sins. Okay. It's definitely it's connected with the forgiveness of sins, right? Yes. Now, very interesting. Peter says, do two things and you'll get two things, right? Yeah. At least in this text, right? He says, do two things. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And you're going to get two things, right? The first thing you're going to get is the forgiveness of sins. What's the second thing you'll get? The gift of the Holy Spirit. That's right. Gift of the Holy Spirit. Um, right there. In fact, and then he goes on to say, he's going to tell us who this promise is. For the promise is for you, that's the people he's speaking to, for your children, for all who are far off, that would include Gentiles, all people who are, are far away from, you know, they're not Jewish people. And then he goes on to say, very general, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. I, I think this is very important because this is, this is clearly what we might call a universal promise. In the book of John, the ending of, of the book of John, Jesus gives some promises to his disciples, specifically to his disciples. He says, when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to lead you into all truth. He's going he's to remind you of all things and don't worry when you go before governors or courts or whatever. You know, you'll be given what to say. That's a specific promise for the apostles, right? For the disciples of Jesus. That is not, that the language is not universal. He's not saying all Christians throughout all time are going to have that promise. But there is a difference between that and this, isn't there? The difference between that text and this text is that one was spoken specifically to uh, the disciples and it was not universalized. And this one is actually universalized. So whatever this gift of the Holy Spirit is, it's not just for a specific group of people, it's for all people. Now that's important because some people will suggest that the gift of the Holy Spirit mentioned here is the miraculous. But it doesn't say anything about the miraculous. It says you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it's going to be for everybody, not just for some people, but for everybody. 
So I think it's clear that this is universal and it's not talking about the miraculous, that this would be talking about the indwelling of the spirit. Again, we don't know what that is at this point, but it seems clear that uh, there is an indwelling of the spirit of some form or fashion, or we might say as the uh, language here, gift, gift of the Holy Spirit. All right. Uh, another passage that makes this, in my mind, clear that all Christians receive an indwelling of the Spirit is in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16, which says, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? In fact, it uses the word dwell there, right? Will dwell in you. And then, of course, Romans chapter 8 and verse 9 says, You... However, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. So everybody sees the, the language of dwelling in, right? The spirit is going to dwell in. Um, and there's even this, this uh, concept of temple language, temple language. And what was the temple in the Old Testament? In fact, in the first century, the temple was still standing. Uh, till 87 D. What was the temple? It was a physical structure, right? Yes. Now, in a very real way, God dwelt where? In the temple. In, in that's the temple. right. Yeah, that's right. In the temple. Now, we understand that, uh, you know, buildings don't hold, you know, the fullness of who God is and all that. But in a very real and special way, God dwelt in the temple. So, Paul uses temple language, we have to keep that in mind. So there was a physical structure that God dwelt in in a special way. Paul says, you now are that physical structure. You are the temple, right? Our bodies are physical, and God's spirit dwells in you. So there is this indwelling uh, of the spirit. Uh, also, I don't know if, um, if, if we all recognize this or not, but the indwelling of the spirit was actually promised even in the Old Testament. In Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 27, God says, and I will put my spirit within, that, uh, within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. So there's even an Old Testament prophecy uh, that the spirit was going to indwell uh, the Christian. So if the Holy Spirit indwells the Christian, First of all, um, everybody, everybody here agreed that the Spirit indwells the Christian, right? Um, I don't think anybody's changed their mind. These passages just confirm what we've already said, what we've already you know, said we agree with. So if the Holy Spirit does indwell the Christian, and he does, uh, according to the Bible, then how does the Spirit indwell the Christian? How does the Spirit indwell the Christian? If I were to ask you that, or somebody were to ask you, uh, we would all agree the Spirit indwells us. But how would you answer that question? How does the Spirit indwell? Would you have an answer? Would you have an answer? That's, that's something to think about. Paul, if somebody asked you, what would you say? That I don't know. Okay, good, good answer, right? Listen, you know, we kind of laugh, but the reality is, you know, sometimes we're not going to have an answer for things, right? I mean, not, we, we are not, you know, we don't know the Bible word for word, verbatim, uh, from Genesis through Revelation and have a computer kind of a mind where we can random access all everything that's in there, right? Nobody can do that. Um, so there are going to be questions, there's going to be thoughts, there's going to be things that come to our, uh, maybe people ask us, or we might ask, and we're not necessarily going to know. Um, and it's okay to say, I don't know. Um, let, me, let me do some research. Let me study the topic. Let me look at it. So I, I appreciate that response. You know, I, I don't know. Uh, does anybody have um, an answer that they would like to present? That, that they, they'd like to say. If somebody asked you this question, would you have a response? I don't have a response, but you know, uh, I'm not really sure I understand how, how my own spirit ah. 
indwells my body. Uh -huh. You know, we know that God breathes into us the breath of life. We know that we become, uh, we become uh, God's creature. We believe at, at conception, but how that, how that breath of God comes into us and how it, how the breath of God that's generally, that's in every human being, I don't think we understand that. Right, right. And, and you know, that's a great point. That's a great point. My, um, Tim, did you want to say something? Well, I was just thinking, I would like to think, you know, that the spirit is connected with our consciousness in a way that that it's there he's there to i feel as a, a moral guide okay um to i i don't know if this is right or not but my understanding is the part of my essence and being that knows what i should do and what i should not do beyond the word i mean i i feel that that god gives us uh, the spirit as as our guide okay okay you know these are great responses uh, i don't know i'm not sure um you know even even with you tim as you you know presented what you think um you know this is what i think you know i, th I think this is this is maybe the way it is um uh, I, can't, I, I can't prove that. Right. Yeah. 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 This is just, this is what I think at the moment. This is what I, you know, am, am believing at the moment. Um, and, and I like what you had to say too, Mike. Um, you know, we talked about this concept of not understanding a lot of things that are in the Bible. Uh, you know, the Bible teaches certain things and we simply believe it. You know, we talked about the resurrection. I don't know how a person comes back from the dead. I mean, it's, it's a miracle. Yes. But like, what, if, you know, how does, how does that work? I don't know. I don't know how a virgin birth happens. I don't know how a creator, uh, God, can simply speak and light comes into existence, right? I mean, so there's a lot of things that we simply believe because the Bible teaches it. So even if we didn't understand the hows of the Spirit indwelling us, uh, I think it's pretty clear, at least from the passages we looked at so far, that the Spirit does indwell us. Um, I think that the Bible gives us some, a, a bit more information as to the how. Uh, it might not answer, you know, scriptures, I don't think answer all our questions, but I think we do get a bit of a glimpse into the how the Spirit uh, indwells us. And there's definitely, the Spirit indwells us by and through uh, the Word. And when we talk about the Word, we're talking about the scriptures. Um, and of course, we've already seen that one of the roles of the Holy Spirit in the ancient world was to inspire uh, men, women, and children you know, sometimes to give revelation and to write those revealed truths down for people to read and study. Um, when Christians need guidance, when, when Christians need knowledge, uh, they go to the Bible, right? We go to the Bible. Um, that's, that's where the spirit inspire, inspired revealed word is found. And at least one way, all right, this is at least one way in which the spirit indwells the Christian, we could say. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I had to cough there for a moment. <clears throat> so I had to mute myself. Um, and, and I think we saw some of this uh, aspect of the role of the written word uh, in the end of John's Gospel, where he says that, um, that it, this was written, that it might bring about faith and people might, you know, believe that Jesus is the Christ, those kinds of things. Uh, but let, let's pursue this a little further. You know, in Ephesians uh, chapter 5, uh, 18 through 19, we read, uh, and do not get drunk with wine, uh, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord in your heart. Now, this is a command to be filled with the Spirit. The reality is, if we're talking about being filled with the, uh, let's say, the personal, you know, the personal indwelling of the Spirit, we can't 
we can't make that happen, right? I mean, we don't have control over God. So this must, uh, I think this is a clue as to say that there's got to be something that being filled with the Spirit is not talking about us making the Spirit of God fill us up, right? Because we, we can't control the Spirit like that. We can't tell the Spirit, fill me up, um, do it now, because uh, this, this is a command. But, you know, it's been noted by many, uh, many theologians, many people who study uh, the Bible, that both Ephesians and Colossians are they're really complementary letters. They're extremely similar, and they're written to churches in close proximity to one another. And they really have a lot of overlap. So Ephesians chapter 5, 18 through 19, there's a parallel passage in Colossians. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, I think you'll be able to see the overlap here. They're really talking about the same kinds of things. It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanksgiving in your hearts to God. These two passages, I think, work together. So when we talk about being filled with the Spirit, it would be my um, contention, it would be my belief that to be filled with the Spirit would be the same as let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. So it, it's connected with the, the Word. Now, granted, back then they had both the oral Word spoken by prophets and apostles, but they also had the written Word as well. And so I, I think we're talking about the Word of God here. And again, the the contexts are really identical, right? Uh, be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, or let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing and all of that. There's another similar passage. John, the Apostle John, makes a similar kind of um, statement in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 24. Look at what he says. He says, let what you heard from the beginning abide in you that's that's indwelling language isn't it yeah. yeah let what you heard now what they heard was the gospel right they had heard that somebody preached the gospel to them so this would be let the word of christ right dwell in you richly something along those lines so he says let what you heard from the beginning abide in you if what you heard from the beginning abides in you we could say dwells in you then you too will abide in the son and in the Father. So I think it's pretty clear that the Spirit indwells us or abides in us in and through the Word. Um, this was true in the ancient world. I think it's true today. Again, back then they had both the written and the oral inspired Word from the Spirit. Today, we have all those oral teachings that God wanted us to have written in a book. So it's all, it's all written in the Bible. Uh, whatever it is that God wanted us to have. And I, I don't think that this is really too controversial within um, the churches of Christ, um, regardless of where a person falls on the indwelling. Uh, I think I'm pretty safe in saying that everybody in this class believes that the spirit indwells the Christian by and through the word. Um, the question might be, is that the only way? But I, I don't think we would have a problem saying, yeah, absolutely. But as we, uh, as we uh, hold to the word, as we rem uh, you know, remember what we had heard from the beginning, you know, what we've read, then you know, the spirit indwells us because it's the spirit uh, inspired and written word. So again, I think that's pretty clear. Now, although that's true, Right. Although that's true, uh, that the Spirit indwells us by and through the Word of God, the Scriptures teach, I think, pretty clearly that the Spirit also indwells the Christian personally. Now, when I say the Spirit indwells the Christian personally, what, what do you think? What, what comes to mind when I say that? I... I... I, I think it, it, it has a lot to do with being able, the Spirit knows me. Okay. Abba Father, uh, when I cry to him or when I plead with him, I think there is a 
certain sense in which uh, it, 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 it becomes more than the word, but becomes the spirit. Yes. Actually, actually knowing me and my mm -hmm. name that, that he takes to the Father through Jesus. I, I think somehow that yeah. is what you know, comes to my mind. You know, this is, um, you know, you said actually. I use the word personally. This is where <laughs> there are some, uh, there are some of our brothers and sisters in Christ who hold that the Spirit of God dwells in the Christian by and through the Word only. That it's, there's not this personal, and so, so when we start talking about the indwelling of the Spirit, what happens is people end up asking, do you mean really? Do you mean truly? Do you mean personally? Uh, do you mean physically? Do you, you know, all of these extra words, um, because they're wrestling with this or they're challenging it, one or the other. And so when I say personally, I mean the Spirit of God indwells the Christian literally, right? You could say literally, uh, concretely, truly, really, you know, however you want to put it. Um, I would say in addition to the Spirit dwelling in us um, by and through the Word, I don't think it's one or the other. I believe it's both. Um, and, and some of the passages I had brought up, and I only brought up a couple because I, I don't think it's that controversial that the Spirit indwells the Christian uh, by and through the Word. The real controversy comes with people uh, wrestling with the, uh, the literal uh, Spirit in, indwelling the Christian. I think, it's, I think the Scriptures clearly teach it. The Apostle Paul, now he's got, he makes a point about pagan worship and the worship of the one true God. And he says that since the Christian individually is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and we saw this language already, that our physical bodies are the very temple of the Holy Spirit. And he says to join that temple, that body, to a prostitute is really to join God, Christ, the Spirit, to a prostitute. It's very it's a very bad, um, sinful, wicked thing to do uh, that nobody would do with the physical temple, right? You wouldn't, you wouldn't do ungodly things by bringing like um, um, pig sacrifices into the temple of God or something along those lines or whatever. And Paul makes a very, a very similar kind of point. 1 Corinthians six fifteen through 20, he says, Do you not know, and I think we all know these passages, but he says, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside of the body. Notice how he's talking about outside and inside, outside the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. This passage, I think, properly understood makes it clear that there is a personal, literal indwelling of the Spirit. Because if it was only by and through the Word of God, this passage I don't think would make much sense at all. Um, because you would not be joining, literally, um, the, the Spirit of God or Christ or anything to a prostitute. There wouldn't be anything physical going on. In fact, they would be mediated through the Word, you know, through the Bible or, or through, the, uh, through the Word. So I think this is uh, pretty, pretty powerful in my mind to say that there is a, a physical, um, literal indwelling of the Spirit. Um, because the Spirit literally indwells a Christian, they are then the temple, and as such, they need to take care of that temple, they need to, uh, to maintain it. Again, this is all Old Testament language, right? This is all Paul utilizing Old Testament temple imagery. Um, We'll have a couple other passages here. First Corinthians chapter 
3, 16 through 17 says, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, notice, notice this concept with the physical body, right? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him for God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Again, it becomes very difficult to understand um, what Paul ha is meaning if he's not talking about the spirit literally indwelling a Christian, at least in my mind. 2 Corinthians 6, 16 through chapter 7, verse 1 says, What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my, notice what he says, I will make my dwelling among them and I will walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from the midst and be separated from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you and I will be a father to you and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of of God. All right. Questions, thoughts, comments on where we're going with that? Well, there's also a passage that says that when when we pray, the Spirit helps us with our prayers. Yes, yes. We are we are pretty much at the end of our time this evening. We are going to talk again next week about the role of the Holy Spirit today, part three. <laughs> and we're going to talk about some of those things. Um, if the Spirit does indwell the Christian, then what, you know, what does that mean? What does the Spirit do for us, right? Um, tonight, we're really just, um, but I appreciate you bringing that passage up because it's one that has to be dealt with, that's for sure. Um, tonight, we're really dealing with um, the indwelling. How does the Spirit indwell us? Um, and not what does he do for us? What does that indwelling mean? Tonight it's, he dwells in us by and through the word of God, but it's more than that. Again, I think, I think if we think about this logically, if a person can have the spirit of God indwelling them simply by reading and studying the word of God, then what would we have to conclude? Think about it for a moment. What would that necessitate? What would that imply? If the spirit indwelling a person, any person, was simply by and through the word of God, then anybody who studied and read and was in the word of God, what would that mean for them? Spirit would be in them. Right. Does any, has anybody ever known atheists, agnostics, people from other religious traditions who study and know the Bible? Some of them even, even more than we do. I have. Uh, you can go online and you can find all kinds of people out there who study the Bible inside and out. They're in there. Uh, but yet, I think we would recognize that the Spirit of God is not dwelling in them. So it can't be by and through the Word only, right? There's got to be some, something different. And the promise was for those who would repent and be immersed. So there's something different than simply um, reading or taking in knowledge or something. Um, I do think that there is an aspect of the spirit dwelling in the Christian when he reads and studies the scriptures, but there's something more that goes on there as well. All right, here's a good question. Well, first of all, let me ask, does anybody disagree? Does anybody think that, that the spirit does not indwell them personally um, or literally. Okay. So how does a person know that the spirit indwells them then? Well, we're told it does. We're, we're t absolutely, right? The Bible tells me so, right? Jesus loves me, this I know. Or the Bible tells me so. Right. No, you know, the Bible never, um, the, the Word of God, the Bible never says that we're going to have a certain kind of feeling. Uh, it doesn't say that we're going to have some kind of an experience, either miraculous or otherwise. Um, 
we shouldn't expect uh, to have some kind of uh, experience to prove that the Spirit indwells us or to say, you know, how do you know you have the Spirit of God in you? Well, I just have this feeling that on this day I was born again and the Spirit overwhelmed. No, the, the, the Scripture doesn't say anything about that. Um, same way. How do I know the Spirit indwells me? The same way I know that God loves me. The same way I, I know a lot of things about the Bible. It's not experientially. I don't experience any feeling or, you know, something deep down inside me or anything like that. No miracles or, no, the Bible tells me so. Um, so, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Um, the Spirit indwells me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. It's, a, it's just it's clearly there in the scriptures. Um, a person can know for sure that the Spirit indwells them because that's what the Spirit-inspired written word uh, actually says. All right. Questions, comments, thoughts before we wrap it up tonight?